We've watched The Matrix. Imagine a modern movie. And wouldn't you know, there's this guy who's like modern human. He gets sucked into some type of wormhole within the internet world. Next thing you know, he discovers like this is not true reality. And then all of a sudden, this man has the powers and he's prophesied to be the one. And you find these weird things that just so happen to have over and over and over and over narrative compositional comparisons to Neo. That would automatically make you go, somebody's talking. When did they talk is the question. It's not if they're talking. At this point, I'm 100% convinced. From Genesis on, I mean, I'm looking for that Greek stuff because yeah. the voice of that Greek author is there. Descendant was known as Batis, a name that means stutterer. Mm. Aaron had to fill in for Moses because Moses was a stutterer. Okay. <laughs> you get Hecate's of Abdera down in Egypt writing about Moses in this same Maybe. manner. Find a story about Moses. Show me a source of a text from a from an author that go that's older than Hecate's of Abdera. I'll wait. Yeah. It, good luck, crickets. Doesn't exist. Cuneiform tablets with, with stories of Alexander the Great on them, which means people in the Hellenistic era. We're still reading and writing, that, so we don't know what Alexandria was like bro, in that time Bro, I period. have to highlight what you just said, it's yeah. so powerful. The main argument forever by scholars, for people, Abraham was historical, his name is so primitive, Abram from maybe the Amorites or from this. Dude, this is the point that, that Thomas L. Thompson brought up in his book and changed the consensus. You can show these names being used in third, fourth century BCE, right. in modern Mesopotamia at the time. Before we start, I have some great news for everyone today. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Now back to the video. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true gnosis. That's right. And I got the man, the myth, and the legend, Derek Lambert from Myth Vision Podcast. We are Myth, myth Vision. Vision. And so we're getting into a subject that Derek and I have been passionate about lately. Mm -hmm. We've recently dropped a video on his channel and did a live, but I also wanted to bring the conversation over here on Oscar Informant to get some more people uh, educated on this. Well, you know, not, or even just to do just to talk. We're talking. Yeah. Leave comments as well. So I want to hear your thoughts on all this stuff. And the topic is the Greek Hellenistic origins mm -hmm. of the Bible, in particular the Septuagint. And a lot of people think the Bible was put together over a certain amount of time and from some guy named Moses who wrote the Genesis. And uh, then there was these prophets that came and Genesis or Kings and Chronicles were documented by David's and Omri and all the Kings courts people. They were writing down what was going on in the Northern Kingdom, the Southern Kingdom, those prophets in the North, prophets in the South. And it's just all clean cut perfectly. And there's a documentary hypothesis that makes it all fit. You know, could be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, documentary hypothesis is is very plausible one that very can plausible. work, and there's reasons why it could work. And then there are others who kind of like say there's what, variations. Do you want to just give them what that is? Documentary. So it's really a okay. four source. It could be up to five, but it's a four source hypothesis of J E D and P. There are reasons why they call them J D J E D and P. J would be the Yahwist source. Yahwist source. Yahwist, and then you have priestly source, priestly deuteronomical source. Yes, and then yeah. And so the priestly source would kind of fit in the Levitical law. It looks like a priestly account for something that's centered around the Jerusalem temple or something to this effect. And there are variations of argumentation of why this makes sense. There's good points, but there are some who want to also go further and say, hey, look, we actually think this might be a Hellenistic document. Which well, you that's what still we're, argue. I was going to get there real quick. I just want to right. finish this off. And then the, the idea is those four sources were stitched together by, some by somebody in the Persian period. Well, it depends. Some people think it was during the exile. Some think it was post-exile. Some think it was in Persia. Right. But very hand, like a handful will argue for the Persia, and that's just a, an analogous thing to say. Right. Not the most popular that it's been. Yeah. It's been since Wellhausen came in, came up with the hypothesis, which was a Protestant, by the way. He he kind of said, "Look, we would say at least Babylon." Uh, Josiah's reform onward, we would kind of say somewhere in there, this redactor, we call them, 
who stitched all these narratives together probably while they had their stay in Babylon. And then other scholars, I, I tend to think after their stay in Babylon when they so were Persian, Cyrus. Right. And that's where you get Daniel's story and all that stuff. Or at least it's saying. Well, that's what they thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when we're starting to get better at, at learning how to do textual criticism, scholars looking at the Aramaic and the Hebrew of Daniel said, wait a minute, this is Hellenistic era language. They're using idioms that only exist in the second and third century BCE. And they're saying this might be written in like 150, 160, 170 BCE right. when Maccabees was written. In fact, Maccabees seems to fulfill Daniel in a right. way. Especially with the Antiochus Epiphanes. With the fall of the, the, the anointed the one, Seleucid Onias, playing the a priest. Role. Right. And then all that stuff with the, the Greeks coming and taking over. Yeah. So Maccabees seems to fulfill Daniel. They look like they were written by the same guy. Maybe Jason of Cyrene who written, wrote Maccabees too. No, I'm not saying I know that for sure. But anyways, throwing I'm just throwing stuff out there. So we all of a sudden, we're now we're like, whoa, there are texts that are written in the Hellenistic period. Right. But now there are some people. I'll let I, you take I, I guess let's use a, a fun analogy, a yeah. playful one for people. At one point, like 100 years ago, if you and me were scientists, we'd be like, the earth is 2 million years old or mm -hmm. 200 million years old. Today, we're now looking at the earth as, what is it, 3.4 billion? I mean, there's like the number expands. We start realizing, hold on, now the universe may not be 14.6 years old or 14.6 billion years old. It may be way older. In fact, we're really starting to wonder based on our measurements, does it go forever? We don't know. Is it multiverse? Is it this? Is it that? My point is, is over time, you sharpen your tools, you, you learn more critical thinking, you start finding out other ways to solve the problem. And we have clearly, even those who are within the documentary hypothesis position, recognize Daniel's late. Daniel's a Hellenistic writing. Right. The book of Jonah is a, is a Hellenistic writing. Uh, there are various in books. In fact, just to jump in real quick, yeah. the, the, the part of Daniel, Bell and the Dragon, that's usually stitched on. If it's in the if it's in the Catholic Bible, it's stitched at the end. Mm -hmm. If it's in the Protestant Bible, it's not there. Um, Julius Africanus wrote a letter to another uh, bishop saying that that particular text was translated from the Greek. Hmm. It wasn't even Hebrew first. It was Greek. For, yeah, I'll you can look this up. I can show. On, I'll give a source on the screen right now. Now. There is, you can go read that for yourself. That's Julius Africanus reading, telling this. And he's looking at the Greek and he's saying, whoa, there's a rhythm here. Look, this word matches with this word and the Hebrew doesn't. So he's saying this text had to have been translated. But not, not, I'm only talking about Bell and the Dragon. I'm not talking about the full entire book of Daniel. Right, right, right. Um, so let's yeah, put that, it, it, most, throw that out there. Most scholars like John Collins, who's yeah. written Herman A on this. I mean, the, the, the book of Daniel, he spent 40 years dissecting this. He says it's, it is clearly a stitched text with right. multiple sources. Yes, exactly. You've got an Aramaic section. You've got a Greek section or, or Hebrew. It looks like it goes from uh, Aramaic to Hebrew, depending on the particular source. It's a rolling at. text. Right. It's a rolling text that has seemingly earlier language from the Aramaic, but then you have this like what looks more modern and they stitched it. And by the way, when we find it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they found these fragments, um, you find them in different patches, like uh, only chapter 11, only chapter this. And you're like, there's no like unified text till later. So you're like, it's like kind of like the Bible. And we talk about the composition of this whole thing. We're like, well, is it only Hellenistic? I think the final composition of it and its narrative structure, it's so well formulated in its final composition. Without a doubt, I think this is Greek in origin. Yeah. However, that doesn't mean, and we've talked about this before, that they're not pulling and drawing from ancient sources. They yes. probably came from archives. Barosis, for example, goes into the ancient Mesopotamian lore, pulls it out, and puts it into a Greek translation right. for the modern. And this is what I think is going on in several of the cases with the biblical Yeah, and let's just slow down for a second. So let's start with who is bringing this to the forefront? How did we even get to the position where we started thinking like this? So I have to say what I think personally uh, on this, and that is when I'm looking at guys like Russell Gamirkin, well, first of all, Philip, Philip R. Davies, um, Nils Peter Lemke, um, looking Dr. at Thomas L. Thompson. I'll throw in Dr. D.C. Amon Hellman because he's a Attic Greek specialist. So Big time yeah. Greek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy, like, 
sleeps. I, he's fluent he's, in Greek. This, I mean, he knows his stuff, and he teaches you. And Greek. he he, swear, he swears up and down when he reads these Septuagint. He thinks this is a native Greek text. Right, right. So right, I'm and I look all let all flowers ta- bloom. Yeah, let's you take uh, let's take every expert seriously at their and, and let's weigh everything together. Consider all this yeah. stuff. And I'm looking at this, and I'm going, okay. I'm looking at Philip Wagenbaum, which I'm going to be highlighting. We're going to read something here in a minute. But this is the real crux of the issue for me. If you saw, and I'm just using another fun analogy. Let's use another fun analogy. We've watched The Matrix. Imagine a modern movie, okay? It happens to be, let's pretend we don't know when The Matrix was made. But we watch another modern movie and, you know, there's this guy who's like, modern human he gets sucked into some type of wormhole within the the internet world next thing you know he discovers like this is not true reality he gets sucked into another place to come to find out robots rule the world and like right. humans are little slaves and are really useless little worms or little critters that are hiding from the robots and then all of a sudden this man has the powers and he's prophesied to be the one and you find these weird things that just so happen to have over and over and over and over narrative compositional comparisons to Neo. Yes. And what's going on with Morpheus and the whole nine. I mean, what if you found almost literary lifts that, you know, uh, blue or red pill? Whoa, 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 you know what this is and you're stuck in the Matrix. Well, nobody said the Matrix, but you see it. That yeah. would raise, that would automatically make you go, somebody's talking. When did they talk is the question. It's not if they're talking. Right. At this point, I'm 100% convinced. The biblical, from Genesis on, I mean, dude, you might find prophets that date older than this, but from Genesis to 2 Kings, I'm looking for that Greek stuff because the voice of that Greek author is there. Right. And by the way, you mentioned like when you watch, like say you pick up a film, you don't know when when it was uh, filmed. Well, you can find out by some of the stuff that's in the film, the technology that they're using, what kind of cell phone he's on, whether it's 90s, 2000s. And this, and there are people who are experts in Iron Age, Bronze Age, Copper Age, or uh, Antiquity, Common Era. Mm-hmm. And they can, t- and a lot of them look at this Genesis through, through you know, the whole Torah up in the Kings, and they'll say, this is like late, late, like way later than we thought originally. Right. Again, the, the stuff that they're getting the older. stuff that they're talking in here, the devices they're talking about, the weapons, the right. armies, uh, anachronism, the cities. Right? They're, this is all stuff that happened in this period. Like right. so, so, so it's like they're a half a, a millennium, half a millennium off from when they claim in the narrative it's happening, from when the reality of the actual events, like we talk about with uh, uh, Israel Finkelstein, we've been right. He brings up over and over and over these twelfth century end of the, the the collapse of the Bronze Age with Egypt's monarch rule collapsing to really the reality of city-states, things that are happening, wars that happen in these locations and are only in the 7th century, 500 yeah, years he, off. Yeah, Finkelstein is saying there, Israel, as we know it, doesn't even exist yet. In fact, he's saying they're probably talking about Jezreel, the city in the north. Right, right. You so he's that probably up. we're probably not dealing with a nation, a, a kingdom. Probably dealing with city states: Jerusalem, Jericho, Jezreel, uh, Samaria. Like these are city Ruled states. By the House of Omri. Yeah, you know. but you have Philistines, you have Phoenicians, you have Canaanites, you have Ammonites, you have these different clans yeah. that are there, <laughs> and it's interesting. It be- is because when we look at, for example, we have Babylonians wrote a lot of stuff down. And we can decipher those texts. Um, also, Egyptians wrote down the most. All over the walls of every city in Egypt, Luxor, Hel- uh, Heliopolis, uh, you name it, uh, Giza. Right. Everywhere. It's all the history of the, what happened in the world. Mm-hmm. There I'm talking about every all these places. And we don't get no Moses. Herodotus, There's no look Abraham. Herodotus. Where the heck is it? Herodotus mentions Israel, guess how many times? None. And this is in the 5th century BCE. Right. So let, think about this for a second. Herodotus writes about everything from the Straits of Gibraltar, which is Spain, North Africa. Mm-hmm. He talks about the Hyperboreans, where modern day Germany and France are. He's talking about the Scythians. He's talking about the Morocco. He's talking about North Africa, Carthage, uh, Italy, Greece, um, Libya. 
Egypt, Sudan. He's talking about uh, right Ethiopians. There in the region. He's, he's talking about Ethiopians. He's talking about the Arabians. He's talking about the the Philistines. He's talking about the Phoenicians. He's talking about the Syrians. He's talking about every Arameans. He's going all the way past India into the Afghanistan people. He's writing about those people. He calls them Massagetai. He even knows who their queen is. Their queen is Tamiris. She's the one who defeated Cyrus. He has all these details about yeah. all these places. But you're telling me he doesn't know where Israel is? Right. Philip R. Davies made a very, like in 1992, I think it was. I can't remember the exact dates. I could be wrong. But I did this in my documentary. You helped me edit. You, yeah. you and me, we pulled together, bro. We yeah. pulled together. That was, a, that was, a, that was and, an edit. And when I found that about Herodotus, that's when I, be, that's when I said, well, whoa. Well, you know, the argument is. And it's well, an argument from silence. Yeah, but. But this is not. This is this guy is going out of his way to write about the whole inhabitable world. Okay, so let's take that argument and add it here on it's not mentioned in the guy whose whole goal is to tell you all the peoples of the earth. He somehow can't tell you about these people. So let's that are on the here. same sea as him. Right. And he's telling you that he's trying he says, when I traveled to Phoenicia to the city of Tyre, when I traveled to Egypt and I met the person in he's in that part of the world. Right. And he's, are you kidding me? He knows about the Arabians. He knows about everyone over there. That's why. He I, even mentions the Ammonites. If you add the tribe. That, you add that detail to the list of the evidence I'm trying to bring up, it, it just keeps pushing things it, yeah. later. So the where I'm at on this, when I ask like, when is this written? I, I wrestle between the Persian, I'll call it black box, and the Hellenistic clear box. And what I mean is, is it could have been written around, and I mean the final composition of a lot of this could have been written around Persia. The question you have to ask yourself is, are Persian people under this empire reading the Greeks? Because if you know Matrix, we talked Matrix, if you know the language is undoubtedly pulling and drawing from the narratives you see here, that they, the closest antecedent to it is this. And we're going to go into one story. I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. But Philip Weinbaum, I think it's Weinbaum, but uh, he goes into this with Argonauts in the Desert and Russell Gamerkin's amazing work. You really got to read these guys. Even Thomas L. Thompson, going to Philip R. Davies, Peter Lemke, go to Neil Godfrey's um, po uh, post, go to his blog, the whole nine. Anyway, um, you, you see Matrix, you have to say, okay, so then these Persians are reading the Greeks, reading Plato, reading these people. How do they know? So I, I bring that up. Do you want me to go ahead and get people acquainted with the Abraham, Frixis, Isaac comparisons? Yeah. Or, okay. I think it's worth doing that, and I'm going to go ahead and show you some interesting things, so bear with me. First thing we want to do, and I had to type it out because I could give you off the cuff, but I might need to reference this to yeah, make sure yeah. we're, we're good here. And by the way, it's vice versa too, because Plato loves the site Zoroaster. But they uh, source The Pythagoreans it. love the Babylonians. They love the Egyptians. It's, this is going back, and you're right, they source it. They don't. So where's the sourcing right. backwards? Right. Right. Okay, they it. did not. So Greeks are... Greeks have no shame in citing Babylonians in and Persians. We got this from them. Yeah. Period. They say we love Zoroaster. They say we love this guy who was an Egyptian priest. They say we love this Babylonian priest. They always mention these people. They and and they like They were really on, good scholars too. Yeah. They cited things. They, they look let, at Alexander yeah. the Great. He put on the Egyptian myth. He didn't change it. Right. He kept it and became a pharaoh himself. He became a pharaoh. Okay? He became a god. And then they in said their they world. said that even when he was in Persia, he dressed like the Persians. So, so he. Ain't this playing, is how the Greeks were. He is not ashamed of yeah. his game, and neither are the Greeks. They loved to give that culture the heightened mythos that that culture has. That's what I love about the Greeks. They didn't come to make everyone turn into Christians. They wanted to Hellenize them. Don't get yeah. me wrong, but they wanted them to maintain their mythos, kind of like the Persians said, "Hey." Go back and build your temple. Go back. You, we're not here to conquer and destroy like Assyria wanted to up place, uproot, kind of change the whole game. No, no, no. Persians kind of go, go back and build your temple. Greeks went way beyond that. They went way beyond in uplifting these societies. So here's where it really got my attention was like, if I found endless Zoroastrian sources, then we could really start placing the stuff in the Persian period confidently. But it's a big black box. And a lot of people go, archaeologically, it's a black box. They say Israelist archaeologists have been like trying to just shovel aside the Persian era to try and find Israel material. And so they're ignoring a lot of this. This is this, There are books written on this. I'm not making this wow. up. Sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's, it's, it's really wild. reality. It really is wild. I, everyone knows the story of Abraham. You and me killed a topic on this just recently. Yeah. But in a nutshell, Abraham has promised a land. 
to be a father of great nation. He has no kids. The guy's 99, okay? Like, God, what's up, man? I thought you were going to give me a kid. And his 90-year-old wife somehow is supposed to have a baby. Then these three guys show up, and it's God. Just one, one of the guys is God. And then, boom, Isaac, laughter. The wife laughs in the tent hearing God say, you're going to have a kid, dude, and she's going to bear a child. <laughs> his name will be Laughter. Interesting how the names always correlate to an event or some type of thing happening and an adjective or a noun or something. Well, Isaac's born after Ishmael and, and the wife are kicked out. Long story short, God commands Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. The reason God commands him to do it is because he wanted to test his faithfulness. Abraham over and over. He was afraid the Egyptians would kill him over Sarah. He was afraid that, you know, Abimelech was going to kill him over Sarah. Uh, he didn't trust God. Now he needs to know in the narrative structure of the Bible, he needs to know that Abraham trusts God. So he goes to go sacrifice him. As he goes, we know what happens. An angel comes and says, no, according to our text we have in our Bible, he doesn't do it. An angel comes and wouldn't you know, there's a ram caught in a thicket in a bush. Once the ram's there, instead of Isaac, he then sacrifices the ram in place of Isaac. Boom. Isaac is alive. The ram is in his place. Got it. Here's a story that if you do not know the Greek world, you're going to want to check this out because this is powerful. The name of a king, Athamas, A-T-H-A-M-A-S, king of Boeotia, married Nephili, a cloud goddess created in the image of Hera by Zeus. Athamas and Nephili had twin children. By the way, Boeotia is just north of where Athens is. So we're, that's part of Greece we're at. Got it. So people know. And I, I don't want to do parallelomania. I want to yeah. stick to this because I almost think of leaping from like... Well, it okay. matters because when we get into Athens, it matters. Yeah, I'm I just, want to set I'm that up about when the, I get into... There's so many yeah. details here that I can't... I'm not going to draw those yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I figure it's interesting to point out like... If we're comparing it to Abraham, it wasn't Abraham who had twins, but it was Isaac himself who had twin children, Jacob and Esau. But that's, anyway, so here you have, and one is by a god here, a goddess, really. Uh, Athamas and Nephili had twin children, a son named Phrixus, and a daughter, Heli. Athamas afterwards rejected Nephili, this goddess, and married Ino. So Athamas the king, who also has promised this land, we'll get into that, but he's promised this land, he ends up like saying, I'm done with you, Nephili, a goddess, and goes for Ino. Ino hated Nephili's children. So Ino hated her stepchildren that were birthed by her husband, Athamas, okay? Mm. Nephili. And uh, so, so here's what happens. She plotted to have them killed by their own father. Ino's like, I'm going to get the father to do it. Ino bribed messengers who told King Athamas that the Oracle of Delphi, speaking for the god Apollo, required the sacrifice of Phrixus on Mount Lephishion in order to end a famine in Boeotia. Just as Athamas was about to sacrifice his son Phrixus, Zeus, and in other accounts Nephili, who's the real mother of these children, um, sent a golden-winged ram to rescue Phrixus and Heli by flying away with them. Heli fell off, hence the Hell's Pont, Heli's Sea. The ram brought uh, Phrixus safely to Colchis, Georgia. In gratitude, this is a sequence of it, in gratitude, Phrixus sacrificed to Zeus the golden ram that saved him and hung, after he sacrificed it, hung its golden fleece on an oak tree. Now, while it may seem quite inconsequential, probably the most important ingredient of this myth is that it is the prologue of the epic right. of the Argonauts, Argonauts, who will come to the Colchis years later to bring the famous Golden Fleece back to Greece. Medea's kingdom. Yeah. Yep. The significance of this will become apparent as we continue. So, uh, just to highlight this, the divine command to sacrifice one's son, in the case of Abraham, it's a real case oh, where the God says... I gotta say this. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. The Argonautica is so big that it shows up in Etruscan art. Mm. There's Medea, there's Jason, there's right. the fleece. Right. If it's all the way in Etruscan art, 
why can't it be all the way over in this way, in this direction? Well, art is important as, yeah. as, as many of if it's, if it's If it's that big of a, a story that it's the playwrights in Athens are doing this play, the, right. the Etruscan arts, by the way, that Etruscan alphabet looks a lot like the Punic. Like, mm. you, like I'm, I'm just, I'm not an expert in that stuff. I'm just looking at it like, you know, so I'm saying the Mediterranean world seems to know this. Right. It's, it's all over the place. It is. It does seem to be in about art is they say that in the Greek world, especially Etruscan onward and stuff, you're dealing with a, a people that if they were influenced by the Jewish people, it would show up in their art. Whereas you don't yeah. find this in the other way around at you all. And they call it's called they called Phil Hellenis, the lovers of the Greeks. Mm-hmm. Phil Hellenis are everywhere. All the whole Mediterranean, everybody's a Phil Hellenis. Exactly. You have people in Egypt call the king of king uh Ptolemy to Phil Hellene. You have Maccabees that are Phil Hellenes. You have all types of Phil lovers of Greeks. Right. They're all over the Mediterranean. For some reason, Greek culture just explodes. Mm. So, okay, I'm just pointing that out. Like, what's the likelihood? Who's drawing from who? Is it the people who call themselves Phil Hellenes, or is it... I mean, the conquerors always... The, the influence is always, you know, the conquerors mostly. Mostly. Yeah. I mean, it goes back and forth, but like... Well, it yeah. depends on the kind of conquerors. Even with the Greeks, they were the influence, though they were not ashamed of adapting and syncretizing to the to the contemporaneous mythology or even the antiquity uh, mythology. They would revive it, revive it. It was like... They had no shame in their game. Yeah. But you knew it was Oh, and Greek. another thing you might be asking, but didn't the Romans conquer the Greeks? So why are the Romans bought? The Romans were already Hellenized before they conquered Macedonia. Right. The Pythagoreans were already in South Italy 200 years before the Macedonian Wars. Right. So the, when the Romans came to conquer Athens, they already had Athena on their breastplates. <laughs> they already were Hellenized. Right. So like that already well, happened. Just a little sneak peek. The Jews were too, and yeah. you read Cattell Berthold. I mean, you, you got out. names like Jude, um, Jason Mack, and you have names like right. Archelaus. That the, the the I have his name right here. the The person who taught Socrates, his name is Archelaus. Mm. Like Archelaus is the name of Her- Herodian, right? Uh, Antipas. These are Greek names. I mean, I, and I always use. They this, love Greek stuff. This is a bad analogy. It's a Greek world. I'm making a contemporary example. I hate Franco. using this one, but I'm using it anyway. We know what happened in the transatlantic slave trade, yeah. okay? But it's an example I must, you know, point out. There are several people today that are of darker skin complexion that have what we would call white man's names, okay, that have been passed on to them. How often in the past two, 300 years do you see white people who have names that are like, like African dialect, right, right, right. okay? Or yeah. finding the tribal names of Africans that come over that they took up their name. They didn't. It was usually Which, by the, the way, that's a beautiful. I love there's so when I watch much those richness. videos of people like that. I love it. It's but beautiful. But I'm just culture. trying to point out. But yeah, I get your point. Yeah, your point makes sense. Is usually coming from the one who's in the control, and that is, and that's that's true standard across history. Yeah. So when you see something in the Greek period when Hellenism happens, you're going to find that influence from the Greeks. You're going to find that influence from the Assyrians or the Egyptians or whoever. And there's never been a time in history that we have recorded where these people in this region conquered yeah their influence is going to be from the nations that are the the mac daddies of the time that are putting that down onto them so this getting into the narrative again of abraham the divine command to sacrifice one son in both one you have where apollo supposedly uh i know is trying to trick to have them because she hates the kids you know, screw nephily you know how that could be there's a beef between women um and that happens a lot even between men but real in the case of Isaac, so the God actually tells Abraham, in this case for trust, kill your, sacrifice your son to me. He goes to do it. The God sends the, the ram, okay? But in the case of, of Phrixus, it's a lie, right? In another case of Phrixus, P's stepmother bribed messengers to tell the father the God required the sacrifice. Can I comment on that? Yeah. Before you go to the next um, example, it reminds me of... In the case of the flood myth, if it's Greek, the case of Deucalion, or if it's Mesopotamian, in the case of uh, the Arthrohasis, there's two gods. One of them's doing the flood. The other one's trying to save mankind from the flood. In the Hebrew Bible, one god 
does the flood and even says, I will, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Right. Here in the same, in the case of Phrixus, you have one God, or you have the, both of the God, two gods, uh, Apollo and uh, I know. But and no, then, I know is the human. I think it's Nephilim. Oh, Nephilim. I'm sorry. Goddess is Nephilim. Right. And then you, you have, have you have the two Apollo. Apollo, who's yeah, exactly, who tricks. Well, it wasn't Apollo. It no, was, you have a, the god that's being tricked. Right, right, right. And the other god. Right. So there's two gods, but in the case of the Hebrew Bible, it's one god, but he also stops them. Right. So he's doing both in he's both cases. Both. Right. So you can almost see where the. Peril, you can almost see it's being drawn from where the, it makes sense with there's two gods. Because why? Okay, God wants you to do with something. He's it about sounds to do like God's schizophrenic. Then he changes his mind. Like, I'm going to kill you. Okay. I, uh, exactly. You just made my point for me. Yeah. Thank you for saying it like that. Because it makes more sense that there's two gods. One of them wants to do it. One of them does it. But when it's one God who does it and then changes his mind at the last second, it looks a little off. Like, why would you put one? It looks like and it's And if being... you go to the Mesopotamian, I, and my details may not be exact here because there's variations of the myth, but if you go to the Mesopotamian, you have, there's two gods here. You have Inki who wants to help humanity. Yes. And then you've got Enlil and you've got these yeah. other deities who are and going, in Greek, in them. And in Greek, it's Prometheus who wants to save Deucalion. It's Zeus who wants to flood everybody. Right. So that all makes sense. That makes sense. There's no mind changing. What doesn't make sense is what God saying, sense is, I'm, I'm gonna ending fl- your life. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done have that. Dang it. Right. So- or I'm going to sacrifice your son right now. Wait, stop. Yes, like, yes, yes. Both of those cases don't make sense. It's just an odd human thing to say. And I guess you could rationalize it by saying, well, God doesn't know what he's talking about. He really didn't know that Abraham would do that. And now that he realized it, I mean, the whole omniscient argument just needs to go out. Because the two God idea makes better sense than the one. In fact, the whole idea about duality, good versus evil, it's good to have the two gods. That makes that's sense. That's what Zor- I think that's why Zoroaster, who... Um, I, they're, they're, like in his time period, I'm not I'm not an expert on uh, Persian mythology at all. Any, but like my brief, my weird, my brief understanding is there was the Zervan, Zervan the main monist, like the god above all. But then there's also Ahura Mazda and Angermanu, and that makes sense to right, have right. that because now you can blame th- what's what's evil. You can't blame it on the one. I think polytheism, if I had to, just, without a doubt, polytheism makes so much more sense as a person who doesn't believe in it. Well, though, but even in the case of Zoroastrianism, where you have Zorvan on top, you have these two main gods that are equal, opposing, right. but even underneath that, you still have daemons. Right, You right. have the daemons, and you have the, uh, I forgot what the other ones are called, but those are like angels and demons, but it is polytheism. Yeah. Like, even, like, people, like, we call it polytheism, but like even in polytheism, there's still that one on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a henotheism or something. Right. But like it's still, it makes better sense of the world than pretending there's an all-powerful one God and that's it and he controls the whole damn Yeah, and Superman. it's... Because it's too... Yeah, there's so that's much... That's why they, yeah, they, they, they keep Satan around for that reason. But the question you bring up is interesting and <laughs> right. it is this. Which makes more sense? One guy who did both jobs, or it started with two guys. I'm that's just my point. An example, and, that's and, I, and later... I did stop you from your next example, but yeah, that yeah. that was my point. No, but that's a good point to highlight, and I yeah. didn't think about that. Yeah. As far as you got real case in Isaac, the God commands him to be sacrificed, and the other case is a lie. Uh, I know is trying to deceive, or really sneak, getting the kids killed. Um, so, all right, the the father. This is the interesting key between uh, Athamas. And Abraham, the father's pious, unquestioning submission to the command. Both are like whatever the God said they were going to do in both stories. God told him to kill him and Abraham. God told Athamas, according to that, the Delphi oracle with Apollo, told him to kill Heli and um, Phrixus. The last minute deliverance of the human victim by a divinely sent ram. Both, right? Direct command to the father in the case of Isaac. Direct command to the sacrificial victim in the case of Phrixus. The fastening of the ram in a tree or bush. Both have this. All of these are examples that are the same in both. And they might be a little detail different. For example, in both cases, it's a ram. And in both cases, the ram ends up in a tree or bush. The difference is, is that in the case of Abraham, before the sacrifice of the ram, in, in so Isaac, he's going to do this. He ends up saving Isaac, then sacrifices the ram. In the case of the Phrixus one, 
It's after the, the ram saves him for Thanksgiving, right. he ends up sacrificing the ram to Apollo. Right. Okay. This uh, and, and Apollo is pissed off, by the way. And this endures. Ap- Apollo's so mad in the story that it takes generations. It, it takes these weird people called Jason and the Argonauts to appease his anger yeah. and go find the Golden Fleece to avenge what And then, the, then after that, so what happens is, this, Herodotus talks about this too. He says because of the Argonautica mission, Apollo then gives an, an oracle at Delphi and says, for the next 500 years, the Heraclides will rule this territory, mm-hmm. which he took away from them. Right. So the Heraclides end up running, which became, they end up, this is actually weird because if you date this time period, you get the, it's in the Hittite period. So are the Hittites the Heraclides? I'm just, right. all I'm doing is matching times up. You have, This is Asia Minor that they're talking about, the location. Mm-hmm. So you have, and then it says, according to Herodotus, Croesus, who was a real king who lived in Turkey right after the Hittite period. The Hittite, so this is after the Bronze Age now. The Hittites collapse. It says 509 years have just passed since, Del- since Delphi Oracle said the Heraclides will rule Anatolia. Croesus is then given the new kingdom of a new dynasty, which is the Croesus, uh, King Midas, uh, Gordian with a Gordian knot. Yep. Gets un- so it's all, this is a whole Brace. new, whole new. We're, we're getting into the this new era. My point, my point is. Um, Herodotus is explaining this history, connecting all this stuff. Yeah, th- I love that. And this is another interesting point. You can't, ju- I'm not just looking at this single guy named Isaac and this single guy named Phrixus or even Athamas and Isaac or Athamas and Phrixus and Abraham and Isaac. Okay. You got to span this whole history or the knowledge of this text to get the matrix theme I'm trying to give. Yeah. Because there's a promise. At the outset to Abraham, I'm going to show you a land. He shows it to him, but he doesn't die in it and he doesn't keep it just like Athamas didn't get to. Athamas does not yes, die and keep the point. land. So Abraham does not even die in the promised land. Wow. He gets buried elsewhere. So the promise is still kind of holding on in the narrative and yeah. it's for his descendants. Here's the interesting part to continue. Yeah, well, uh, and, uh, and that's the thing. When I mentioned that the Hittites... The Hittites are very well connected to the Babylonians and the Assyrians in their culture. They use the same writing style. They use that cuneiform text. And these stories are going to the Greeks and getting put into the Greek world and then getting written in uh, linear, whatever it is, linear B at the time, which then becomes Greek. Mm -hmm. So you have transmission of these stories going from direction from Babylon all the way to uh, the Mediterranean world. So all it's not surprising to me that there's right. so much overlap. Yeah, I'm going to go back into this narrative structure to kind of give you yeah, a big picture because we did the zero in on Abraham and Isaac yeah. and, and, and Athamas and Phrixus, but to go, divine promises of a land to be inherited by a hero's descendants, Abraham's descendants, a special, de- and Athamas descendants, and it's his descendants. So if you read the story, you'll see in Jason the Argonauts, they are direct descendants of Athamas, just like they are direct descendants of Abraham in this. A special divinely chosen people. I mean, look, anyone who knows, people like to talk about Jewish people and this chosenness is a bad thing. And I get it. Trust me. I'm not denying there isn't a, a superiority. And I hope that we're not coming across as like Greek supremacist here, but I think it's, it's just kind of... That's why I mentioned the Hittites. Right, right, right. Because like, it's not just Greek. It's just the Mediterranean world itself. I just I right. wanted to emphasize that to make the point, like, for those who want to pick on the Jews and act like, well, um, they're Jewish supremacists because they're cho- chosenness and we're chosen people and no one else is, Gentiles aren't. Yeah. Um, just read about the Athenians. Find out how xenophobic they were, and everyone who was not one of them, even in the Greek world, were almost a form of barbaric. Unless like, it was some sort of philosopher like Zoroaster. Oh, right, right. Or so, yeah. They would have been gifted. Apart from that, dude, yeah, the Athenians xenophobic, yeah. were the supreme. They call people barbarian. If you were, didn't speak Greek, you were barbarian. Right. So And so there was a supremacy kind of concept Even, the, even, even their neighbors, the Scythians, who were, I mean, they, say, they call them barbarians and... They have some pretty mean things, but like they weren't like 
like really they were pretty civilized. Right. But they called them barbarians. Right. Know? So So I just wanted to highlight yeah. that for for those a prearranged time schedule of four generations before the land would be inherited in both cases. This is a powerful point. Prearranged time schedule four generations before the land would be inherited. Deliverance through a leader who initially protests it's like what the Rogers said. Because he's he stutters. Listen to this. This remember now, this is spanning into Moses' time, okay? Deliverance through a leader who initially protests because he stutters. And we're going to bring that name up here in a minute in the Greek world. An additional delay because of human failure to hold fast to a divine promise. A wandering through desert with a sacred vessel. Mm. Guiding divine revelations. What does that remind you of? Exactly. The Ark Ark of the Covenant. Covenant. So this is the reverse of the order in which we read the sacrifice and the promise in the biblical narrative. There, Abraham has promised the land and afterward prepares to sacrifice Isaac. The Argonauts seek to appease Zeus's anger of the attempted sacrifice of Phrixus by retrieving the fleece of the ram that saved him. And the promise of the land of Cyrene for the descendants of the Argonauts is made afterwards. Generations later. By the way, that's modern day Libya, North Africa, that region. So. Generations later. And Colchis is connected to Libya in that way because when Medea was became queen of Colchis, which is where the golden fleece is found, they said she was a princess from Libya. So they're always trying to connect these two lands like that. But go ahead. Generations later, after the descendants of the Argonauts had settled on Thera, a direct descendant of Euphemus was commanded through the Delphic Oracle to lead his people to settle and establish Cyrene in fulfillment of the promise made at the time the Argonauts were retrieving the fleece of the ram that had saved Phrixus. The descendants, sorry, the descendant was known as Batis, a name that means stutterer. Mm. Aaron had to fill in for Moses because Moses was a stutterer. Okay, <laughs> he literally told God, like, I- I'm not, I can't lead your people. I-, I can't even talk right. I have a stutter. Wow. Moses says this in-, in his narrative in Exodus. And guess what? It's okay. I'll give you Aaron so he could speak on your behalf. You now, see what I'm saying? This mythology becomes big in Cyrene, Cyrenica. It wouldn't be surprising that you get Hecateus of Abdera down in Egypt writing about Moses. In that same Maybe. manner, because I just want to give you to throw out throw this out there. If any, this is a a challenge to anybody can find a story about Moses written by a person. So don't just say it, the Hebrew Bible dates to 700 BC. No, show me a source of a text from a from an author that go that's older than Hecateus of Abdera. I'll wait. Yeah. In, good luck, crickets. Doesn't exist. And, and just so you know, it says that he argued against the divine command on the grounds that he was not a great warrior and that he had a speech impediment. But the Delphic Oracle refused to listen to reason. Sorry, li- to listen to reason and made him do as he was told anyway. Herodotus tells us that Battus ruled Cyrene for the familiar 40 years. <laughs> Moses, Moses was in the wilderness for... 40 years. But before that, he was 40 and years. This is here. North Africa. This is right there. And so I, you could see how this Mediterranean world, how things are being passed along, mm-hmm. but tweaked, changed. Yeah. Characters' names are changing. You know, God's names get changed. You know, Apulu comes Apollo. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got Soul Invictus or Helios or uh Ra or th- like they're all sun gods but they all and Bacchus and Osiris they both are the same underworld f- god of the vine who like right. this you, you can see the Mediterranean world is so interconnected this way but at the same time they tweak their own things they personalize them sometimes they polemicize the other one right you know I, for me and here's an example of that like one can argue that these myths were around before the Hellenistic period and this is the case yeah. for this myth Here's the deal, though, because we see it in Etruscan art. We, we know these characters at least exist. Right. The, the narratives we are talking about, maybe not as far as Etruscan times, but I would say at least post-Herodotus and stuff, we at least see a very formulated narrative. Here's what I'm getting well, at. That's what Medea shows up in Etruscan art. Right. So that's, been, so that's, there's that's the Argonauts. some form of the myth going yeah. on before and that's, that. And that's, and that's another thing. It's like you don't even get the name Moses mentioned until Hecateus. I, right. I said story, 
but it's not even you don't even get his name mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like that's like like we found Medea's name mentioned on some art. We don't know what the story is. We don't know if they changed it. We don't know if it's different. Probably the same story, maybe a little different. They spell it Mattia. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. but like, where's the where's Moses and Abraham at? You know, where's Noah? At? You sound like Thomas L. Thompson. Yeah, and I love this because Thomas L. Thompson in his book against the patriarchal, like trying to show why it's fruitless to try and find Abraham. He, he like spends a lot of that book he, arguing, saying like, "You think a name proves a person exists? Let me give you an example. Moses is not a Hebrew name. It's not a Canaanite name. It is an Egyptian. Egyptian Moshe. Here's the deal, though. If you were a, a person, it's the most who was common. Reading, it's like Michael. If you were reading a Greek translation from yeah. a guy who's named Manetho, who brings us the Egyptian name, this is third century BC. Okay, right. Fourth, third, fourth century. Here's the deal." All you would need to do is have read uh, this guy, uh, this Egyptian priest who's translating into Greek to have this Egyptian name we call Moses. Moses. If you can't find that in the ancient world and you can't source it, th this is the Russell American approach. He's saying stuff like, hey, this name Moses shows up here, but there's no reason to go, well, because it's Egyptian, it could have been 15th century in the, you know. <laughs> okay, BCE. and that's the funny part. And now here, you're going you're to say this is another argument from silence. But it's a big argument for silence, and here's why. If Moses really did these events, these are drastic. We're talking about, like, Pharaoh getting defeated, plagues happening, uh, half the population, whatever it says, yeah. populations being moved left. And, and imagine if it's, this guy Moses is behind it. Where on the walls of Egypt, where I mentioned before, go to Luxor, go to Heliopolis, go to Alexandria, Go to Giza. Go to Cairo. Go to any of these cities. I don't pick one. Go mm -hmm. there. Go to the go to Ramsey's Pie. Go to any of these cities, and on the wall you have all their histories of all the pharaohs from the first dynasty all the way to the last dynasty, and there's everything that happened every year. Where's Mo fine Moses on there? Yeah. He doesn't. He's not on there. And this would this this should be on there. And you then they'll think? say this is embarrassing. They lost. They well, guess what? Ramses defeated the Canaanites. He didn't lose to the Canaanites. Yeah, they yeah. Gained. So the reason why I bring up Ramses is the dates after the supposed exodus, Canaan is still being conquered by Egypt. So wait, you're telling me the Israelites are wandering in the desert. God brings them to the promised land. But then, it, but then Egypt conquers them again? But the Bible forgets to tell you this. The Bible acts like Joshua's conquering this. Jo land. Yeah, what, I thought it's Joshua the conquering. Right. But it's Egypt doing that in the historical, historical record. record. We have no record of Joshua. Right. And then, and then last thing I want to say about Abraham, it says he lived for 175 years, that he was his father was royal. They lived right, he was right behind Nimrod as far as how high up he was. And uh you he's fighting wars. He's fighting wars against tribes in where my, where the Assyrians are and where modern day Syria is, uh, right over by southern you know Iraq, uh, Turkey area, he's winning all these wars. He's conquering the land. He's meeting with this Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Mm -hmm. And this is a king we're being mentioned. Where is this king in history? Where is all this in the historical record? Right. Where is this in the archaeology? One hundred and seventy five years is three lifetimes. You're telling me a man did all of this legendary stuff in three lifetimes. We can't find a speck of archaeology to back it up. That's not an argument from silence. That's just, right. that doesn't make sense. Because like an argument from silence is like, you know, it's like someone didn't get mentioned who, like, like Socrates didn't get mentioned at the party that he was but it's, at. But that's not... This is different. Yeah, this is not... This, this is, is this is like, we're talking... Leave a mark. We're making claims that archaeology should be able to back up. Yeah, there should be no reason there isn't evidence yeah. in support of this. So the fact that there isn't any evidence, it's like Jonathan Adler's archaeological approach on the origins of Judaism. He has shown that before the Maccabees, pretty much in that time, right around there, 3rd century BCE, you do not see Judaism as a religion. No. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is it because it was practiced and somehow the evidence just somehow, you know, it got lost? I mean, you're talking supposedly, according to the biblical tale, like th this religion was reformed by Josiah in the 7th century. Where's all this evidence of this practiced religion? We see 
thousand, over a thousand, maybe more of these ceremonial pools. Remember where we were in Magdala? That's that yes. synagogue over there? Yes. You see Asherah poles. You see. But, there's, it looks like there's a, a polytheism culture still. But there's like a baptism pool there that the yeah. Jews would dip themselves in. That's Judaism. That's Judaism, right. My but but of, I'm saying before all that, oh, yeah, it's yeah, all polytheistic. Yeah, yeah just got, like the elephantine papyri. Yes, what we and see those are there. Jews too, right. So you, you're you stuck with this thing for me on the Greek thing. And this is one last thing I'll just say on this. And yeah. that is I'm looking at it and then you got Plato. Once you add Plato into this mix from his Timaeus to Critias to Genesis, what's going on with the creation, and then looking at the laws. There's certain laws that Plato says that are found nowhere in the ancient Near East. How does the Bible authors have laws that correspond to what Plato talks about as laws for the greatest, you know, if you're going to make the greatest nation and its laws that are divine. These are the laws. How is it the biblical author has these things? You know the idea of having a king that's condemned in the Bible? You remember that? Yeah. That's exactly what Plato condemns. Yeah. Guess what? The ancient Near East, they loved kings. Kings were good. Kings were amazing. They wanted and notice what else? Rome doesn't like kings either. So where do they get that idea from? I wonder if the Greek world and, and by the way, Plato. being ruled by judges, that's something you see in the Greco-Roman yeah. world. Yeah. And then is it there twelve judges? And then being replaced, second? yeah, yes. And there's twelve tribes, of course, which right. are very Greek. And right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so <laughs> yeah. Number twelve shows up. So good, such a good point. By the way, also in Plato's Republic, we have a, a world Athens. Being run by a senate, well, you can call them judges if you mm-hmm. want, mm-hmm. ruled by judges. And Plato wants a philosopher king, someone like a David, right, 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 to come and be the you know the cultural leader, if you will, right. But and the so co- the idea of king, a like tyrant, he calls yes. it he specifically says tyrant, and that's exactly what's co- the narrative in the Bible with Saul co- shows you why that is not what they want and. It, there's so many reasons it condemns this idea. There's condem- even the idea of slavery. You're right. You it can, matches what Plato's saying. You're right. You can own other nations, but you can't own your own. Play, and, and look, look at David. This. He's playing the liar. He's he's the herdsman. He's not the typical tyrant. He, they're trying to show right. you what a good leader is in this text. He also has a lot of parallels with King Kinneris, who's up in Paphos, which is a Greek part of the Greek world. And also Phoenician world, right. Shouldn't we should, you know, the Adonis and Venus, it's either Eshtar, Eshtarte and Adonis, or it's Aphrodite and Adonis, depending on if it's Greek or if it's Phoenician text. But uh, it looks a lot like when we're looking at David and Solomon, by the way, David had a son named Adonis. Hmm. It was one of his sons' name. That's, uh, and then his other son, Solomon. That's kind is, of the name of a god. Yeah. And his <laughs> other son is named uh, so, uh, other son Solomon acts like Adonis, right. where he's worshiping Aphrodite and he's got all these women around him. So you're like, wait, there's so much happening here that reminds us of the. And Pathos is right next to Israel; it's right there. It's the island, closest island. So what I'm saying is, you're seeing all you're seeing all this diffu- all this diffusion of culture happening in the text. Now, what I think is happening is this: I think. We look at the Ugaritic text, the the, the, the the actual evidence of like what's happening in the Israel world, the Canaanite world, uh, the world of Jerusalem. It's polytheistic. You have El, you have Yahweh, you have Baal, you have Asherah, you have these different gods, whatever. And I think as philosophy grows, especially in Athens, but also Babylon and Egypt, you got different hubs of philosophy happening. Um, I think there's this idea of the one trying to move this idea towards the one. And this is why I think Athens comes into the picture because when you start following these Athenian schoolmasters, Heraclitus, for example, this is not a, this is before the Heraclitus is critical of people around him that are worshiping idols. He sounds like Jeremiah. If you read his text and he loves Zoroaster too. He cites Zoroaster. But you get to Thales, and Thales is, uh, he, you know, he's famous for saying water is the principle of all things, and God is the mind which shaped all things from water. And you're like, whoa, it's almost like Genesis right there. And he teaches a man named Anaximander, who affirmed that there's an unlimited all that is, uh, that has no need for anything. It's perfect. It's where all life source comes from. 
and he teaches Anaximenes, who who names this thing the RK, the first. He says that this RK breathed air into the life of matter and separated life from, from matter, who teaches Anaxagoras, who brings in this term called the noose, the mind. By the way, the Christians loved noose, and they use it interchangeably with logos. In the beginning was the logos, or the noose, the mind. And then, so Anaxagoras teaches Archelaus, pure, nat- pure naturalist, by the way. So we have some, so they're real philosophers. They're fighting back at each other. Pure naturalist, who happens to be the teacher of Socrates, where we get this reserved judgment. We don't know anything. You shouldn't have any dogmatic ideas. You should always have debates. How do you know what you know? Right. And I'm doing this to, to bring us down to where we're going to go. Socrates teaches, Socrates' star student is Plato, which is where we get into what we were talking about with Plato, with the philosopher king, with Plato saying that Homer is bad. Homer is not teaching people the ways that they need to be taught. We need to replace this mythology with a better mythology in an ancient law code that goes back to the gods. Right there, he says it. He tells you the blueprint Mm -hmm. of what looks like the Septuagint. So let's leave that aside for now. He teaches um, Aristotle. Aristotle teaches Theophrastus. And Aristotle also teaches Peter the Skeptic, who is sent by Aristotle to travel the world with Alexander, take notes on everything you find, meet the Brahmins in India, meet the Magi in Persia, get all their knowledge, bring it to Alexandria. We need everything. He does that. Uh, he, by the way, he starts the school known as skepticism, and he's also a high priest of Zeus. So you're like you're seeing like this, this um, pushback against the whole world of superstition and in, in, in replacement of a more. It's still superstitious in our standards, but in their standards, it's more of like. Idols don't do anything. God is perfect. You you don't need idols. Well, like, uh, comparing it, it's. Even we would look at it and say it's less superstitious. It's less than superstitious, what it was. right? Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. Okay, so it's actually somewhat scientific. It is for what they, they really were trying, are trying to be exactly. They're right. trying to make a religion that is more scientifically uh, sound, more philosophically sound as well. Something that makes sense. Something that people actually could believe in. Mm-hmm. And anyway, so this is what brings us to the final. Pure the skeptic teaches a man named Hecateus of Abdera, first person in history to ever write about Moses. We lost his work, weirdly. You would think that would be a text that the Christians would want to preserve. I wonder why we lost it. I'm not saying there's a conspiracy, maybe there is. We only have fragments from people citing him. Right. So you got to piece together. By the way, um, uh, one of the best sources for reading Hecateus is Russell Gamerkin. He puts them together. Mm. I love Russell Gamerkin for that. Hecateus of Abdera is... um, also, uh, so, uh, okay, let me back up a second. The, I mentioned Theophrastus was a student of Aristotle along with Pyrrho. Pyrrho teaches Hecateus. Hecateus goes down to Alexandria with another student of Aristotle whose name is Demetrius of Philarion, who was the, he was the archon of Athens when Cassander took over Macedonia after Alexander died. And then, Alex, and then when Cassander got taken over by Demetrius uh, Polyocrates, Demetrius, this sounds confusing, just stay with me, please. Different names, but... Different. Demetrius of Philarion is forced to go with Peter the Skeptic and build the Library of Alexandria, where all the knowledge of the world is brought there. And then it says, we have multiple sources, it's in Josephus, it's not just in Josephus, but it's in uh, it's in a bunch of sources there's letters we have the letter of aristius we have i think there's other sources as well but anyway this is well documented that demetrius of philarion was commissioned by king ptolemy to put together a law book from the jews and to gather all the books in the habitable world hmm. and this is the this is the project that i think in my personal opinion and uh Gamerkin thinks so as well. And I'm not saying that they just started from scratch and then the Jews copied them. I think the Jews had, I think a lot of the Jewish culture 
was absorbed and I think brought they're into looking the fold. To Phoenician, Canaanite, uh, Mesopotamia. They're looking at various. They're looking things. at they Hecateus. Alexand- yeah, Hecateus. They're looking at Barosis. Barosis, they're looking at Manetho, Manetho, they're looking all at, that. They're and, putting and they're it all together. Looking at a lot of other stuff we don't have. Right. And, and the point is, is when you follow this line of brilliant geniuses, and then you end up with a guy named Demetrius of Falerium who's commissioned to put together the Septuagint. What's more likely? That this line of brilliant thinkers are responsible for this? Or this line of brilliant thinkers just happens to walk into a translation? Hmm. I'm just saying. One one side looks a lot more likely to me. You know, and, and look, I look, I keep saying this. I'm not saying that there wasn't text floating around in Judea. I'm not saying they didn't have prophets. I'm not saying they didn't believe in El. They didn't believe it. They had Yahweh. They had a temple of Yahweh. We know all this. We have the Ugaritic text. They have all their, that's all there. But what I'm saying is something about the land of Israel that these Athenian law, um, these Athenian philosophers were looking at. I don't know what it is yet. I'm not even like gotten that far and like why, or I'm not, like I'm not just going to like, come up with an answer so I don't have I, I need to find data for that but like it just seems a lot like this is what happened and around this time is when the text is put together that's what I think I'm gonna continue searching and I know you will too I just I can't the matrix is there it's just win right and I just want to ask you just in the last thing uh what are what, what do you think because I gave like I kind of threw, that's like a hot take right there. I know it's not the consensus. The consensus is Persian period, uh, or, or the Torah, Babylon, and then the Septuagint is translation. But I'm starting to think that it's cl- it's all put together in the Hellenistic period with sources. Okay. What do you think? I'm going to say, so this is going to sound like a cop out, but it's so complicated of a matter. I agree. That I don't know if I could say with any certainty of anything other than I would go with the most obvious things to me, not come up with historiographical hypotheses to try and go, well, like take, for example, Gamirkin's point that um, look at the typical documentary hypothesis is Genesis 1 is one tradition. And it might have sprinkled into it an older tradition, but really it's one tradition. Genesis 2 is a whole different creation account by a different author who contradicts Genesis 1, and they're put together. Well, go watch Seth L. Sanders in his interviews on Digital Hammurabi. He's like the guy who knows how Hebrew language came to be, and he talks about how people say it's so old, and he goes, actually, right. and you've got to read this work. It's good. I, I remember but hearing he this. made a statement on this podcast that I put together while doing my Enoch video, which is like the number one video on my channel. And he said, there's this really weird thing about the Bible. And, you know, we have these documentary hypotheses. And he said, no ancient text in antiquity anywhere put two combating or even contradictory traditions side by side t- simultaneously into the same piece of literature. So he said, scholars are scratching their heads going, what's this about? Gamirkin says, I'm not convinced that these are two separate traditions necessarily just being spliced together here in Genesis 1 and 2. He takes the Plato route in Plato's Timaeus. Timaeus has a scientific creation by the Demiurge, the crafter. Then you have the lesser deities who get their hands dirty, making mankind from clay with their hands. The daemons. The daemons, or really like you're dealing with like uh, Prometheus, uh, Athena, Zeus. These are all deities that are their descendants, the theogony from the ultimate Demiurge which is different than Hesiod's Theogony because he right. doesn't have the ultimate Demiurge picture like Plato. But right. the point is, is like he takes that approach and says, no, no, no. There are two creation accounts that are complementary that explain the story of the generations of heaven and earth, Genesis 2, 4. Well, I'm starting to take this kind of seriously and think, are we dealing with like over centuries? You have you this don't... old scholar and then you have this, I don't know. That's Why? so funny you said that because Heraclitus in one of his fragments says, that he stopped being a theologian, became a philosopher, when somebody couldn't under- explain to him what chaos in Hesiod meant. Hmm. Which is so funny, because I yeah. just gave you that whole genealogy of thinkers that are trying to get away from Hesiod and Homer. Right. And he's saying, 
in the but beginning was, is chaos, and then out of chaos leaped all these gods. Yeah, and he's like, no, no, and no. And he no, says, no. can someone explain to me what chaos is? Nobody could. I'm done with theology. I'm a philosopher now. Right. And it's like, not you it's just chaos. said it. You just said that in another way. Yeah. Without, except, it's, yeah, I agree with you. That's, it's so complicated. And we're missing so much. Like, for example, the fact that we don't have Hecateus of Abdera hurts us in understanding well, who Moses is. There's no telling what we don't, we don't have. know. We, we, we don't have enough to say. And what, by the way, everything I said, I just want to make this clear. It's just where what I think. Yeah, you're speculating. I'm not fun. saying I'm right and you should listen to me. But it's interesting. I'm saying ch- fact check me. So I read the comments. And a lot of times some people change my I'll read something and I'll say, huh, that is a good point. And I'll, you'll see me in a couple right. of videos later tweaking myself. Well, let me give you an example. Modern, I like to go to modern, right? Everybody knows Tupac. Everyone knows he got shot. I'm not going into the whole conspiracy. He survived. The guy died. Yeah. The point is, who shot it? Who done it, right? Well, you have these like, Biggie had this beef with him, right? Because it was all public. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, who shot you? Separate the weak from the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, like, you're like, what's going on? And anyway, there's all this beef going on. Yeah, your girl, you know, the main. Right. Well, of course, he'd be the number one candidate, right? Well, then we go, well, hold on. There's some stuff between the gangs in California and what was going on with with the the chief guy of Death Row uh, Records wanting to like own his name and cut him out. Okay, so he was willing to get shot in the process. There's hypotheses. Imagine if all you have is the biggie beef. Okay, we don't know about the little minutia of stuff. That's what it feels like. And, and you're just trying to point out like, and come I'm on, trying guys. to piece together with what with, with makes the most sense. But I, but I know for sure that I'm missing something. I know it. I'm admitting that. Right. Whether it's maybe it's from the Hittites, maybe it's not the Greeks. Maybe they're maybe both the Greeks and the Hebrews are borrowing from the Hittites. Well, like I'm just I'm, I'm I made that whole I up understand. just now, yeah, just yeah. to say we don't know for don't. sure what's going on. I would be something, too I, but it seems to me that what we've been taught is doesn't make sense right now. That's, yeah, that's where I'm at. We're trying to figure it out. I just think that that the minimalist school, Copenhagen school, Russell Gamirkin, uh, these guys, I'm ch- I'm taking them. I never read their works. And at this point, I'm really taking the Greek world read into them. consideration. Please. Because when I first heard Gamerkin's theory when I was young into this, my channel, I heard it and I said, that's interesting. But I, don't know. I didn't either. I, I, was, I was like, like that's, that's cool. He's got to be. But when you actually read what he says, he's so, he has it so mad. He's the he's really figured this it's out. It's not just him though. That's I know, the whole he, thing. but he's really right. thought this through, and he's really like everything you throw at him. I'll ask say, "What about the Sumerian stuff?" Yep. Oh, we well, had Barosis. Oh, wait. like right. he's thought and of there this. Wasn't just and Bar- if you think you have a question that's going to stop him in his tracks, right? Watch out. He's ready. He's gonna. He'll be able to answer it. There is so much that in the Hellenistic period. He has an answer to explain where the Greek myths come from, where the Mesopotamian myths come from, where the Hittite, the Phoenician, oh, the Canaan. All of these mythologies yeah. can be explained in a Hellenistic period if you read Gut Russell. And what I meant by he's not the only one wasn't to say, don't read him. No, read him. Don't think he's a lone wolf as if he's the only guy who's saying Greek period is when this stuff was written. Right. I thought that when I first got into this. I didn't know that the school of Copenhagen Hagen had some original gangsters in there. Okay? Yeah. There are some heavy hitters in the school of Copenhagen yeah. that are actually out here doing the Hellenistic stuff and saying this stuff. Yeah, so it's late. really not that fringe. There no. are people saying this stuff. And the last, I completely forgot about this. Recently, from reading a lot of sources like I do, I've come across cuneiform tablets. With, Ale- with stories of Alexander the Great on them, which means people in the Hellenistic era were still reading and writing in with the cuneiform. With yeah. that, with the, yeah. so you had scribes that were able that knew this. So who knows? So, so, that, so we don't know what Alexandria was like. Bro, in that time I period. have to highlight what you just said. Yeah. So powerful. The main argument forever by scholars from like Eusebius onward, really before that, but yeah. anyone who tries to say these are historical people, Abraham was historical. His name is so primitive. Abram from maybe the Amorites or from this. Dude, this is the point that, that Thomas L. Thompson brought up in his book and changed the consensus. You can show these names being used in 3rd, 4th century BCE. Right. In modern Mesopotamia at the time. Right. Modern southern Egypt at the time. Chaldea, so which is Chaldea. That's what they right. call it. So you have to ask yourself, like, okay, 
Why am I pushing this into the second, third millennium? Because the narrative says it happened right. then? Again, bringing up the archaeology. No, it's later, but it's using a... A name can be used from the third millennium all the way down into the first AD. Okay? Yeah, first yeah. century AD. And that does not prove any historicity to a character because they have a look, name yeah. that goes way, way back. Their name's still being used around that time. I've had... I've heard I've had people say to me like this is full stop for me. The fact that you have Tiamat and Tahom being cognate showing up in the Hebrew Bible, it's full stop for me. This has to be ancient because of that. And I'm and I did not back then when I heard that, that was so convincing to me until I saw those tablets with King Alexander has died today hmm. in cuneiform. Right. And I said, Oh my god, Tiamat is, is right there. In, in in the Alexandrians can read this stuff. Well, I think in my documentary I did with Joshua Bowen talk about this because he knows the languages. Yeah, he's expert. in Syria. Yeah. Check him out. Read his books, the Atheist Handbook, the Old Testament. He points out though, and other scholars realize Genesis one is demythologized. It doesn't have that sea dragon. Right. Completely cut out. And that to home, it's been argued is this like has its direct connection to the name Tiamat. Right. He says in his book, if we're being really honest, and he quotes several other scholars. It isn't like this derivative directly from Tiamat. No, it's it's, it's way back, way past. Yeah, yeah way past. I, that's it's what very I, yeah. scientific, if anything. Yeah, it's not. It's this. like it's like seeing a, a fossil in some stone. Right. Like it's not like the animal's dead and you're looking at the dead animal. No, yeah. No, this is back. Like, right. but that's what that shows. Right. Right. And, he's, and yeah, 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 yeah. I just thought, man. But I love that the language we would think was dead. Or these concepts would be dead. No. no. So that that would have made, I think it's terminus ad quem or termin, ad, terminus ad quo, like the oldest. You could go way, way back. And they used to do that. Scholars used to go, well, could be, and they go way back there. But it's like, it also could be because it's still an active language being written by scribes, as you say, in the Hellenistic period, right. cuneiform. But And this is the thing that gets me. This is the so this is why I'm convinced it's Hellenistic now. I'm just going to, I didn't say this yet. And this is the best time because we're going to end on this. Right around this time, fourth at the end of the 4th century BC, into the 3rd century BC, okay, Ptolemy 1 to Ptolemy 3. And then after that, all of a sudden, now Greeks are citing Septuagint. All of a sudden, you get Maccabee period. All of a sudden, now Israel is a known thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Whereas before that, never, not even single mention, nothing. Thucydides, Herodotus, Xenophon, Homer, Hesiod, uh, who, I, I don't know, whatever. Let's go to Pindar. Let's go to Sappho. Let's go to uh, Euripides, Plato, uh, or, or no Israel, not mentioned once mm -hmm. by anybody. None of the sources. All of a sudden, after the third century BCE, all of a sudden they're mentioned all the time. Everyone knows who they are. Right. So what does that tell you? You think the, all those texts are written before or are these texts written when everyone starts to figure out who these people are? Right? Well, they're they're creating their That's own what makes foundation sense. myth. What do you what is a foundation myth? It's you and me in the 20 21st it's you and me in 2023 saying, "Ladies and gentlemen, our ancestor Shmaka ran a tribe over in this region and he, you know, ruled a mountain peak and yada, yada, yada. It's you and me talking about this tribe that we came from and they were named this. And, and, and we, yeah. we backdate this ancient story and that, that would be a foundation myth. And what Israel is, is a foundation story. I mean, you have a guy named Israel that has 12 sons and ends up being the, the father of the 12 tribe. It's so narrative. It's not even realistic in the literal sense. It's more, let's, let's enjoy and if the you were, myth. if you were Demetrius of Falaria trying to find the, the, the most ancient divine laws, and let's say you came across a tablet from Babylon, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you could see how that gets brought into the, the Genesis story. Right. You could, because Demetrius is telling you what he's trying to do. He wants to be the most ancient divine law story. Mm -hmm. And that's what Plato wanted. And he's from the line of Plato. I feel like the, the, the scribes were competing with the best of the best at the time as Philip Wajimam, Waj uh, I got to figure out exactly how to pronounce that, but I think this is my thoughts. If he's right, and I don't know that he's right, but I think that he's onto something, that a scribe who's well aware, or scribes that know the Greek philosophy, the stories, the myths, and they know Plato, 
and they're trying to write a foundation story for their national people and they know how to do it now that they got the playbook are trying to write a better one and trying to compete with the Greek world. The difference is, the difference is, Greeks were accustomed to sourcing who they got their stuff from. Right. The Bible doesn't, do, it wants to ignore that. But it wants to be older, right? But it wants to be older. It wants yeah. to pretend that it, because imagine, you start telling, hey, I took this from you. You're admitting they're You just dated you. yourself. Right. Right. So that's why Abraham comes from Earl Chaldees. That's why he is the oldest examples you can go and get. This guy is clever. Whoever these authors are, they're slick and they're trying to leave no evidence of the murder. And they do slip up because they mention iron beds that only exist in the Iron Age. <laughs> right. And they're supposed to be in the Bronze Age. Right. So it's like they slip up. Several cities, the Philistines were not in this region at the time. Genesis. Right. Claimed. There's a lot of stuff There's like so that. There's so much too. stuff. We talk about Lester L. Gravy. Being- Dude, we've done so much on these channels that I hope people will continue to follow our work. Join us on adventures. We're going to the Holy Land to see these sites where the narratives are, and they're saying these things happen. Not saying they did, but come enjoy the myth with us. I mean, yeah. we're trying to enjoy this stuff as scholarly historical research. And yeah. um, anyway, there's so much stuff, Neil. I appreciate you. Yeah. And by the way, I want now that I've just thought about this, what I want to do at some point is I want to put a list together. If every historian that wrote like in depth about geography, about whatever, like, and just to show you how deep the list goes before Israel ever gets mentioned in any source, it's bad. Mm-hmm. You have a steli that probably says Jezreel. That's your one source. Right. And then it's like, what else do you have? You have all these historians, hundreds of historians that lived in all these centuries None of them mentioned Israel. You know what you, is going on? Using that point, look at the twelve. But if tribes. I showed you on a, if I showed you on a piece of paper the name of all these historians right. from all their time periods and, and where they live, it. and I'm gonna say none of these mentioned. And by the way, and then I'm gonna show you another list. These are the people who mentioned Israel. I'll even give you the Renepter Steli. I'll even give you. I'll even steal man any possible ones. Right, right. Possible. You'll get two. You right. get two compared to like two hundred. It's bad. It's interesting too. One more thing on this yeah. whole, like it's lacking. Even in the Bible, I've had, um, I've had a, a Dan Dershowitz. I think it is. Eden, no, not Eden Dershowitz. It's another scholar who does like 12 tribes of Israel stuff. Look at the list in the Bible. They're not all 12 tribes. Oftentimes it's only six or it gives you eight. It they don't have the it. right calculations. Dan They're is in, Dan names. is out. Where's Dan? Right. Yeah. There's all sorts of problems. And then later it becomes a fixed number. Later. It becomes a fixed number. So that's why I think there's earlier sources, whoever this is working Also with. in Herodotus, because there's... Sti- oh, I, I, we, we keep we keep, we keep going. This yeah. is the last thing I want to... Uh, uh, who knows? In Herodotus, he does... I mentioned that Herodotus talked about the Phoenicians, the Arabs, the Syrians, the Canaanites, the Philistines. He's mentioned everybody, the Egyptians. He says things that make you go, is he talking about Israel? He mentions a priesthood in the Sinai Desert that have tassels that um that do blood oaths and they only worship two gods of mm-hmm. uh, uh, Aphrodite and Bacchus. And you're like, wait, is this who he's talking about? Is this some sort of like Israel? Is this some like proto-Israel? You're like, but he never says Israel. He never says Judaism. He never says Yahweh. So you're like, okay, maybe not. And then he mentions in in Egypt at a certain time in Egypt there was twelve kings that ruled all of Egypt and they intermarried with each other. And then you're like, is this Herodotus getting at the same thing of the Hebrew Bible? And you're, you're, like, it makes you wonder, is right. this where the sources are coming from? I don't know. Once again, is there stuff that I'm looking at? I love this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess you ask me, I don't know. I, but I can tell you, I, I, see like that the, answer. I see the matrix in the in the narrative. And I have to ask, where did that come from and when? And I'm, bet- I'm torn between Persia and, and Hellenistic, and I lean Hellenistic, but I don't know. I, I couldn't say much more. Well, I think that's I think that's uh, fair to be, because to, I think with the data we have, we got to be like Socrates. We got to withhold our judgment and say, we not be dogmatic about this. Yeah, I think that's the best way to go about it, and just keep digging, keep looking for something that maybe no, no one else has seen, and bring it to the table, challenge everything, challenge us, challenge, challenge yourself. You know what I mean? That's what I think, so. I think so. I think you've all just attained true gnosis on this one. I had it right there.